Hello, viewer, and welcome to Spotlight here on Hope TV, where you look and leave. And on Spotlight, we always do our very best to bring you persons who are transforming our society in the direction of light by the power of God. And so we are glad on this edition of Spotlight to have with us our Reverend Dr. Thego Mutahi, who is the moderator-elect of the Presbyterian Church of East Africa. And this is an Easter edition, and we will be getting insights from him concerning Easter, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and what that means to us, especially in this season. Uh, Dr. Thegu, welcome. Thank you. We're glad to have you again. Glad to meet you again. And I want to say viewers love you. Ah, wow, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm happy. I also love this station. <laughs> yeah, um, they, they, they always... Uh, like your insights and Thank your you. angles, your perspectives, yes. especially to theological questions. I'm humbled. So we are happy to have I'm you. I'm a servant of the Lord. I'm willing to share what God has endowed me with. Oh, good, good. Yes, yes. And uh, the last time, uh, several things have happened. Because yes. the last time you're here, you were Reverend Thego Mutahi. Yes. Now you are Reverend Dr. Yeah. Thego Mutahi. Yes. And on top of that, you are mm. also the moderator-elect of the Presbyterian Church of East Africa. I'm so humbled. That's a lot. In, all in one year. It's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot, you know. So what do you say to God about, about that? Well, well, uh, he has taught me to be humble mm -hmm. for every generosity he extends towards me mm. because wow, I, I can't count on anything. I can't talk about my effort. I can't talk about my things. I can only say he has done it for me. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there are so many, you know, impediments on the way. But the Lord takes you through them, you know, or you overcome them. Sometimes you think you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. But the Lord takes you across them. Mm -hmm. So... It's like going across the Red Sea, where there is no bridge, where there is no ship, yet you find yourself on the other side. Mm -hmm. What would you attribute your closing the Red Sea to, other than the Lord? Mm -hmm. So that's what it is. Okay, so it is the doing of the Lord. Indeed it is. Uh, I mean, like, just asking again, yes. um, do you feel surprised that within one year, yeah. so much can happen, or... Uh, has it always been your ambition? It could be an ambition accomplished, prayer answered, <laughs> or it could be like, maybe I thought about it, but I never thought it would happen this way. Well, there are things, there are things you think about and aspire, but until they happen, you are not sure. Mm -hmm. There are things you look forward to and wish and pray and plan and uh, wish it will happen at some day. But then when it happens is when you realize, wow, it was not as easy as I had thought. Mm -hmm. It took the intervention of God for them to happen. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is that these things are not far off from our thinking. Because we have seen other people who have such accomplishment, and we look up to them, we would wish to be like them. Mm -hmm. But eventually when it happens to you, you realize it was not a patapotea thing. Mm -hmm. It was God who designed it, and uh, you were in every place because he wanted you to be there. And it happened because he wanted you to be there. Mm -hmm. So you really see the heart of God. Much as it was at the back of your mind, much as you planned and organized yourself for it, when it happens, eventually you realize it was God. Mm -hmm. But there are also surprises in the course of it because there are things that happen and you wonder, really, did I plan for it, really? Mm -hmm. What did I do to qualify? Mm -hmm. What did I do to get it? So that's when you realize that uh, your life is in the heart of God. Mm. Yes. All right. Yes. All right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, you are joining the tradition of some very um, reputable leaders mm -hmm. who have been moderators of the Presbyterian Church. Yes. A whole heavy lineup. Indeed. You know, when you think about it, yes. uh, people who have really influenced uh, not just the denomination, mm -hmm. but the nation. Amen. And even the region. And even to some level, the globe. Yes. You know, yes. Uh, with their theological wealth. Yes. Uh, and I know this is a big question because yes. you are yet to enter the uh -huh. office, yes. uh, but I would imagine that you have been reflecting about it. Indeed. If you were to be asked what would be the one output mm -hmm. you know, within your time mm -hmm. of leadership mm -hmm. that you'd want to see uh, in your denomination mm -hmm. and also in the church, in mm -hmm. Kenya especially, mm -hmm. what would that output be? I would say one thing I would... Prayer and hope will happen within the period God will allow me to be in office mm -hmm. is a return to spirituality. Mm -hmm. Much as there is a lot to be done in terms of, you know, growing the church, in terms of physical infrastructure, but I would want a church that really has spiritual growth, where people are uncanned on the Bible, mm -hmm. 
where people respect the word of God, where people live the word of God, where people share the word of God and witness the growth of the kingdom of God here on earth. Mm. Because that is what church should all be all about. Although there are many things that we do in the course of, you know, getting there, but I see, like, over time, there's some dust that has gathered, gathered over our, our spirituality. I wish we would be able to dust, you know, our spirituality to a point where we are closer to God. We really, when we talk of God, Emmanuel, we are talking about a reality, a God who is with us in whatever we do, in our speech, in our utterances, in our thoughts, in our relations, in our politics, in every aspect of life. I would want us to dust our spirituality properly because th that is where I see like we, we have gone astray. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, spirituality. Yes. Um, I, I'm, I'm imagining the way the disciples yes. began their walk. Yeah. And when they were in Antioch, mm -hmm. uh, out of their life, yes. they were first called Christians, Christians there. Yes. Because they were like Christ. Yes. And I would imagine that you are talking about that kind of spirituality. Indeed. That is potent, that yes. is visible, yes. that, is, uh, that, is, that can be observed. Yes, right? yes. And uh, I pray you all the best as you pursue that. Uh, and, um, you know, a help. You have a help along the way. Yes. Let me call it a help. Uh -huh. Because uh, you're taking leadership at a time when there is a, uh, we're in the midst of a pandemic still. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. this pandemic has really shaken, yes. you know, the, 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 the life of the church. Indeed. And so you are coming to leadership at your level mm -hmm. at a time when the church is rethinking itself, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. or rediscovering itself yes, or yes. repositioning itself. Yes, yes. And uh, uh, from where you sit um, and from where you discern, mm -hmm. uh, what would you say should be uh, the marks of uh, the recovering church? Well, I would think first, if you go into history, if you read the Bible, you realize that there is always a new normal for the church. If you remember those days when the children of Israel were in captivity, there came a new normal when Moses came and negotiated with the king and it was time to leave. And you know there were challenges when they were trying to adapt to that. There were some who wished that they would go back to captivity. Again, when they went to the promised land, there was a new normal where they were a theocracy, but they wanted a king, like the kingdoms that were allowed them. And much as it happened, that's not what God had ordered for them. So I think this new dispensation should not surprise us because that's what God has been doing all over time, you know, bringing us to a new normal every other time. You remember even the church in our country and in our continent went through revival in the 30s, in the 40s, because a new normal was needed. So, even this outbreak of a pandemic could be ushering in a new normal for the church. And it's us as leaders to think about what God is saying through this pandemic. What does he want us to change? What does he need us to adjust? And that has been the church all through. If you study church history, the church has never you know, walked on the same plane all the time. There have always been surprises from the Lord. The church has always been you know, shaken one way or the other. Sometimes it would look like it's going down, but... It is for the good of the church. Mm -hmm. So I would say that um, this, in, uh, the outbreak of the pandemic should help the church to reinvent itself, mm -hmm. to think about how it needs to do ministry within a time like now. And I know many churches have done that. They have realized the power of, uh, you know, ICT. They have realized the power of ministering to people who are not physically in the church. They have realized, you know, the adjustments they need to make at times like now. So this is something we need to go to God and tell him it's not that you want to destroy the church because your, word, your words were that even the gates of heads shall not prevail against the church. So God cannot go against his promise. So this is not heads. Mm -hmm. It is a new normal that the church must adapt to. So it's up to us prayerfully to start asking ourselves how do we need to approach this new situation so that we minister administer through it because we don't know how it will, how how soon it will come to an end if it will ever mm -hmm. and if we have to live with it we have to continue ministering remembering the promise of god that the church will survive beyond any challenges mm -hmm. yes All right. uh, and um, let me appeal to your side of the prophet mm -hmm. and uh, because this is a new dispensation yes what do you see as the most radical mm -hmm. 
or the most different thing mm -hmm. that will happen in this, uh, what you can call uh, post or uh, pandemic, uh, pan pandemic sourced, mm -hmm. um, uh, just, you know, reformation mm -hmm. of the church? What would be the most radical thing that you foresee? I still go back to what we had started mm -hmm. about spirituality. Mm. That we need to make our members spiritually sound, such that whatever challenges, whatever challenge will come our way, the members will be equal to it. You know, it's like when you are well fed and uh, you, are, you are faced by a disease. People who are well fed are able to withstand, you know, an attack than who, those who are weak. That's what even the medics will tell you. Mm -hmm. So, meaning then that if our spirituality is light, if we have taught our members to be spiritually sound, much as this pandemic, has come to, you know, bring down some of the things that we held very dear. You know, fellowships where we were singing and, you know, shouting and ululating together and doing things together. It appears like the pandemic is against them. And again, the giving, you know, the giving is usually done physically. Now we have to make do with giving where people are not uh, in the sanctuary. You pray for their gift or their home. Mm -hmm. But if those people are spiritually sound, wherever they will be, you can be sure they will start with their church, they will start with their faith. And I can give an example of Daniel. Mm -hmm. Daniel was taken to captivity. Where he had been taken, his parents were not with him. He was, a, he was in a strange land, but the young man kept his faith. He was under a lot of pressure, you remember? And he could as, as, as well have said, you know, I'm far away from those who taught me these values. Mm -hmm. I don't see them allowed. There's no CCTV allowed to report that I'm not doing the right things. I can as well now get into the things that I'm being asked to do. But the guy was spiritually sound. So along with his colleagues, they said, we can't worship the gods of this place. Along with his colleagues, they said, we cannot eat the food that is devoured from this place. So I think the challenge that is being thrown to us as a church is that we should never, you know, go slow mm. on matters of spirituality. Mm. Because we don't know what nature will bring next. We don't know what other thing will be introduced that will go against what we are used to. So traditions will no longer be... So we will not be strong as they have been. Things will change. But if people are spiritually well, you can be sure. Whether they will be in the sanctuary or out. Whether they will be physically with us, us ministering to them, they will still support the church. And I, believe, and I know there are some churches that have remained strong. Not many. That have remained strong through the pandemic. Many of us were saying, no, 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 no. Open the sanctuary. We are running broke. We have no money to pay salaries. We have no money to, money to pay taxes. Come on, government. Open the churches. Well, it is important that churches be opened, and eventually they were opened. But we still realized we have to social distance within the churches. We still realized that not everybody was willing to come back. Hence, the important thing is that we must ensure that our members are spiritually sound so that they are able to face any enemy mm -hmm. that will come our way. All right. Yes. So um, spirituality is, um, is a core thing. Indeed. You know, and a sound spirituality at that. Yes. And when we talk about the Easter season, yes. it's a high season in terms of the Christian calendar, in terms of the Christian story. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people may say that it is even the highest, Indeed. even that there's the death, the resurrection of mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's begin with you as mm -hmm. a leader. Yes. Uh, and maybe you can tell us what specific inspirations mm -hmm. that you draw mm -hmm. from the Easter season. Well, as you have put, uh, correctly put it, is the highest, is the peak of our faith. Mm. Because without the selection and Apostle Paul talks about it, then th there's no meaning being in this faith. Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ now, you know, opened the doors for many other things in our own faith. Hence, as a, 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 as, as, as a Christian personally, I, I, I feel this is a period we should be looking forward to, preparing for it, mm. not just the dates, but, but, but even as we talk about other things, remembering that Easter is coming to remind us of what happened in history for us. Mm. And therefore, as a church, we should never be found and prepared for Easter. Maybe sometimes we just get surprised that Easter has come. Maybe Palm Sunday, you know, those people in the secular world realize that Palm Sunday has come and you find, you know, they have the frauds on their vehicles and their motorbikes. And some of us will say, ah, oh, me, this means that Easter has come. That, that should not be the way. The way should be that as a church, as Christians, we should prepare for Easter when Easter comes to an end. Mm -hmm. We should be preparing for the next Easter mm -hmm. because it has so much meaning for us. 
we can't avoid not to get the full meaning every other day, every other time, because we have no strength as a Christian faith without Easter. So my, my, my take would be that churches should try to understand Easter even when it's not Easter. They should try and ask ourselves, what does Easter mean for us? Try to understand and teach about it and learn from it so that when it comes, it does not pass us, pass us by. Okay. Yes. Um, and of course, the Easter story, mm -hmm. if we start, you know, what you talk about, the Palm Sunday, mm -hmm. all the way to um, uh, the Resurrection Sunday. Yes. There's a lot of things going on in mm -hmm. the Bible story, yes. you know. Uh, and of course, there is the death, there is a resurrection. But there's some twisting things there. Mm. Uh, and I would just want us to hear from you what you see as uh, a most intriguing thing for you mm -hmm. when it comes to the story of, of Easter. Uh, Something uh, that boggles your mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there are so many good things about Easter mm -hmm. and so many things that you lead and you, wow, you ask, is, you mean this happened? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but particularly the words of the cross, you know, that ke Jesus kept on speaking. You know, and particularly when he is speaking to the lobbers and he is telling the lobbers you'll be with him in paradise. And then there's all, the question is now, is this good for the church? Because now we need believers who come to church every Sunday, who tithe and give their offering, you know, who are faithful, to to attend uh, even home, home, home meetings. This guy is just on the cross. He's just there, you know, and he's asking for a favor and it's granted. You, sometimes it intrigues me. <laughs> it makes me wonder now, would, would my church survive we had, mm. if Jesus is giving direct tickets to heaven, you know. <laughs> and there are some you've banned. You know, you know and we have told those guys, you know, you're out there. You're either in church or not. You're either with us or not with us. But this guy somehow finds his way <laughs> to, to, to paradise without having to get baptized, mm -hmm. without having to be confirmed. Never tithed. You, you know this guy never tithed. <laughs> you know this guy never attended any fellowship. And here he is now walking, you know, with his head high to, to heaven. When I'm, I, who have done all those things, I'm not sure about it. Uh, you know, <laughs> so, so that, that intrigues me. Yeah. I, and makes me now to want to understand God. I know I cannot fully understand them, but that makes me more Christian than ever before, that you, here is God, who has taught us and who has bequested us the church, who has taught us to be faithful, not to forfeit, mm -hmm. coming together as believers. But he is a guy who never attended any, any, any church meeting. He, only, he doesn't know church. Not at all. He just knows heaven. Yeah. That's all he knows. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so when you think about it, yeah. you, you, you really get, you know, you have so many questions to ask. But again, we know that there are some questions we, sh we should preserve to ask when we get to the other. Yeah, life. yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. And, uh, uh, it's interesting that Jesus told this man mm. today. Today. You know, mm -hmm. today you'll be with me in paradise. Uh -huh. And uh, which also makes us think about how mm -hmm. Easter is named mm -hmm. or how it is determined. Mm -hmm. It's a shifting season. It's a shifting holiday, so to speak. Yes. Uh, now sometimes it's in March. Yes. Sometimes it's in late April. Yes. And uh, it's predetermined. Yes, it's, yes, yes. It's not like uh, the Islamic uh, holidays that are determined online, mm -hmm. like you observe the moon yeah, and then yeah. you know this is the day. Mm -hmm. But it's shifting, but mm -hmm. it's predetermined. Yes. Uh, and the mathematics, the formula mm -hmm. of determining where Easter will be. Mm -hmm. uh, and can you tell us how, from your understanding, well, well, from the my, dating of Easter yeah, is done? Yeah, yeah, from my understanding is that, you know, we want to be faithful to, ex to the exact date when Jesus is selected. Unfortunately, the calendar that the Jews used is no longer in use, where they said, you know, the month of Nisan, you know, th th that month has been overtaken. So we, we, we try to get our Easter out of the experiences of the time. What was happening? We realized it was spring, and we realized that uh, there was a full moon before the, 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 the resurrection. So we try to tie that to our time. You know, this is the time when uh, we would say it is after March 21, is there a full moon? The full moon, the Sunday after the full moon, that's the calculation. It's quite mathematical. Sometimes it's confusing. No, no, and it's good because it's done for us. So we don't have to struggle to do carry one. You know, this is the day. To the, but to the, to the power of 10. To the power of 10 <laughs> and, uh, and all that. Mm. Algorithms. But, you know, all those things and, yeah. uh, you know, matrix and brackets and board mass. It, it's not us to do that. It's done by, you know, by, by those of us who understand it. And it is never long. Because it talks about the period that Jesus resurrected was spring in Palestine. It was after the full moon. It was in the month of Nisan. 
So when you put all those factors together, it brings us to March 21. Because Easter will never come before March 21. It will come March 21, full moon, the Sunday after the full moon. So I, I think that would be the easiest way to explain to people, but they are happy, they are lucky that they are not made to do the calculations. The calculations would mean that since it happened in the month of Nisan, of the Jewish calendar, it happened during spring, then it must be the month of March, after March 21, once the full moon is done, the next Sunday mm -hmm. should be Easter. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I think that's the, uh, the simplest yes, that's way the simplest to understand way it. To explain it. And, you know, uh, you've said that it's good that we are not left to calculate Indeed. it. Indeed. Because there will be a whole conflict. There will be so many know, around. Yes, yeah, so many that this church, yes. uh, you know, commemorates Easter on this day yes. and another one on this day. So, yes, yes. as you say, it's done for us. Yes. Um, uh, let, let's let's uh, shift it to some, uh, in addition, of course, that is a long formula of calculating Easter. Yes. Uh, but let's uh, look at some more uh, complicated things mm -hmm. around the events of Easter. Yes. Uh, and uh, one of them, you know, and our viewers would want to know about that. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, it's a question that we keep asking and asking is, mm -hmm. is this the question about Judas? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Judas... Um, He's got, he's, he betrayed Jesus. Yes, yes, he did. And uh, he was not forgiven. Yes. Or rather, it doesn't look in the text mm -hmm. that, you know, that there's forgiveness happening. Mm -hmm. it does, it's not expressed. Mm -hmm. It's not there. Mm -hmm. uh, but the catch is that it looks like his, this betrayal that he did was inevitable. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. somebody should have done it. Mm -hmm. Or somebody either way would have done it, mm -hmm. whether it was Judas or somebody else. Mm -hmm. because how else would have Jesus, mm -hmm. you know, saved the world without going through mm -hmm. uh, the death that he did? Indeed. And so is Judas guilty? Well, according to scripture, he's guilty because Jesus talks about it before his crucifixion and he doesn't talk about it in a very pleasant way. So Jesus, uh, Judas starts condemned according to scripture. Of course, when you look at it from a human point of view, it, it, it would sound like, well, it had to happen. He did it. Where did he go wrong? But again, remember the mysteries of scriptures we have just talked about. There are things we never really understand because there are people who are justified yet we think they shouldn't. And there are people who are condemned yet we think that, well, they should not have been condemned. For instance, when you come to the case of King Saul, he is condemned. Yet you feel like what he did, he had some an explanation to it. Because when he spared Agag, well, Agag was a fellow king. Why would he want to kill a fellow king? And uh, you would still understand, he says, you know, I got the best of the animals to sacrifice to you. B but he is condemned. Then uh, there is King David himself, his successor, who takes away somebody's wife. And somebody, somehow he is able to negotiate for his forgiveness. So you, you realize that these are the mysteries of scripture. But now what, uh, the, the, the simple understanding about Judas is that uh, here he was in the inner circle, and uh, very trusted, given a very high responsibility. But then he, he is able to sneak out of the fraternity and, uh, and do some treachery out there and do some betrayal out there. I, 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 I think that does all, doesn't also sound very nice, that here we are in a fraternity, and then you are doing your own plots against your master, uh, you know, stabbing him on the back. Somehow, even when you look at it from that human point of view, Judas would not look very good even in our own setup. Where you are part of the system, you are part of what is being done, and not accidentally, you design. You do a real good design and even get a payment for it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, even in our human relationships, it wouldn't look very good. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, humanly, you also understand why he would start betrayed. Much as, again, when you go to scripture, it was prophesied. Mm -hmm by the prophets, okay. that Jesus would go to the cross. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the challenges of you know, understanding scripture. And by the way, we are not supposed to understand scriptures fully. Otherwise, God will stop being God because we will have known every, everything about him. And he's not, you know, we talk about the knowledge of God, the peace of God that surpasses human understanding. Mm -hmm. So we are still to, we, we are, and Apostle Paul also says, that, you know, when we see things, we see like we are seeing through a window. We don't see it clearly. We see it dimly. Mm -hmm. So we still have to accept that not everything will come clearly to us, even as we read scripture. But my simple understanding would be that Judas was a, a, an honorable person. He did not behave honorably. 
Mm. Yes. Okay. Yes. That, that's interesting also because earlier on you said that uh, Jesus was giving away tickets mm -hmm. at the cross. Yes. <laughs> and he determined who would pass. Uh -huh. And, and who now would Judas doesn't seem to get the pass yes. quite, yes. not obviously. Uh -huh. But just in that same context, uh -huh. there is Peter. Yes. Peter expressly says mm -hmm. he doesn't know Jesus. Yes. Yes. Now, at least Judas uh -huh. said, that's the one. <laughs> You know, uh -huh. Judas said, that's the one. Uh -huh. Jesus, just, Peter says, I don't even know him, uh -huh. you know. Uh -huh. And yet Peter mm -hmm. is on, it's like openly uh -huh. forgiven, uh -huh. embraced, uh -huh. and made even the leader uh -huh. uh, of, the, of the church, uh, uh -huh. according to the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I would understand Peter because, you see, there's a man who, whose design was to be with Jesus. And that's why he even attempted to go in. You know, others had fled. Other than John, who also says he was there, and uh, he, in fact, in the, in the, in the gospel according to St. John, John says he negotiated for Peter to be allowed in. So John says he was there. But for Peter, you can look at his intentions. This guy wanted to be with his master. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be there. He, that's why he made it there. And it was night, and you know, it was cold, and he did not have any company. The master was already arrested. So he had very good intentions. But he failed humanly. He was not able to withstand the pressure when it was directed at him. When it was directed at the master, at least he gave, he gave him company. But in what was directed at him, he could not withstand it. So I, I would try to understand him as somebody who had very good intentions, but failed humanly at a point. And like Judas, Judas had designs all along. He had been paid, and he had thought about it, he had slept over it, and he had decided this is the way to go. That's why he is boldly coming and saying, this is the guy. He is not saying this is the guy because he is my savior. He is saying this is the guy because I wanted him arrested. But Paul, well, but Peter is put under a lot of pressure. You know, here he is alone. The other disciples are afraid. And it, you know, the master has already been arrested. The master himself looks helpless. So who, who do you expect Peter to have done? At a, well, I'm not being his advocate. <laughs> but I'm saying now, under such pressure, and being got out that you, you, you have been with that guy. Yeah. You just, you just, you know, that, you know, there are things we say when we are not under pressure. But when we are really under pressure, it becomes very difficult for us. And that's why we need to be prayerful and alert all the time. There are people who say that, uh, you know, the, 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 the boxer is so good until he receives the first, you know, the first hit. You know, he has a design about how he's going to win that fight. That when they give me this, I'll give them back this. And I'll give it severally. But the moment they receive the first hit, all things change. So I try to understand Peter from that context. Mm -hmm. That here is a guy who had very good intentions. He went to be his master. He went there when other people had fled. But then the pressure became too much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. A man, Peter under pressure. <laughs> uh, our viewers, we are talking about Easter, uh, handling a uh, different uh, interesting things about the Easter season. Mm. I'm sure there are many things also that uh, you celebrate about Easter, also many things that you ask about Easter. Uh, we are taking a short break. We'll be right back. Uh, this again is Spotlight. Mm. 